Jason Weston, who is a research scientist at Facebook AI Research, and he is interested in st statistical machine learning for language and dialogue. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, interesting layout of the room. Um, and yeah, so this is changing topic a little bit from the last talk in that it's about dialogue, but it's still about interaction. Um, so yeah, this is with um, a few other people from Facebook AI Research uh, listed here. So and yeah, I go straight to summary of uh, of the talk. And uh, you know, if I don't get through all the slides, because there's a bunch of slides that basically go into a lot of detail into the second point, I just kind of want to get the main things. Um, and that's uh, when when a, a chatbot is. I want, I'm interested in a chatbot that can learn how to how to talk to people um, while while it's talking to people. So you know the uh, the ultimate goal would be that thing is online uh, on the internet and as it's talking to people, it's learning. So so that would be the interaction, right? The interaction with the humans on the internet. And uh, the summary of the talk is that there's a, a couple of things that we've kind of looked at in, in that interaction where, where the chatbot can learn. So one of them is that a chatbot can improve itself by understanding a teacher's feedback or response, like that, that is their textual feedback, the next utterance that happens after the chatbot has spoken. So if you're thinking about reinforcement learning sort of terms, you've got um, the pre, you know, the current state would be like the dialogue history, your action, which is your 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 chatbot speaking, the the, the thing that the chatbot's going to say, and then you've got the change in state. Uh, is going to include the human next response, um, and the idea is that you can uh, one uh, way of seeing that the chatbot has understood what this uh, response is about is by seeing if it can predict that response given the previous dialogue history, so given the, the, the original state plus its action. So I'm going to have some slides that show that. Basically, this is like forward modeling, which is you know what people also do in, say, uh, vision or robotics. They, they try and you know try and predict what the next video frame would be, given you know the previous video frames and the action that you're about to take, or they try and predict what, you know what would happen to the state if you move the robot. Um, so, but here it's a much stronger signal, uh, I think, because it's got all the semantics of the human speaking uh, in response to your action, which is a, is a really rich signal. Um, and one kind of action that uh, a chatbot can do, I mean, obviously it can, you know, I mean, this is dialogue, so the actions are just saying things. So, I mean, it could say a statement, it could be, you know, it could be answering a question, or it could be asking a question. So, if I look at that set of possible actions, a set of uh, asking questions to a human, then this particular set is, is a kind of interaction which is very good for collecting information and learning, obviously, right? So, if your chatbot knows when to ask questions, um, this, this can improve its learning and its generaliza generalization ability greatly. So, uh, so that's the second point, basically, is like, how do we do that? Well, how do we do both of these things? Um, and yeah, so the rest is sort of details about these two points. Um, so I'm going to go, hopefully, over the first one slightly more quickly than the second one, because uh, I had a poster here at NIPS already. Um, so this is a chatbot can improve by understanding a teacher's feedback. So if you're in this reinforcement learning setting, forgetting about the, the response of the teacher, you might have something like this. You have some conversation history. Mary went to the hallway, John moved to the bathroom, Mary traveled to the kitchen. This is these uh, baby tasks. And then you have a question from the human, where is Mary? And then you have this action uh, the chatbot saying. So here, the chatbot tries to answer by saying hallway, which is 
incorrect because Mary's in the kitchen and you if you're in a sort of a, a normal reinforcement learning setting where you think about numerical rewards you would think of like a, a reward of zero there and a re reward of plus or one or whatever you or some sort of positive reward if you get an answer correct but let's think about what happens when the uh, the teacher the human the uh, text in black uh, responds to that uh, action that answer so where is Mary? Play, uh, the bot, chat bot says playground. And the, um, the human can say, no, that's incorrect. Right, so this is a textual response. But it kind of, um, it sort of, yeah, correlates basically to that numerical reward of zero, right? No is zero, and yes is, is one, if you like. Um, so, but you can't deal with it exactly like you could with a numerical value, right? You can't use the normal reinforcement learning. So what you need to do, or one way of dealing with it, is forward prediction. So as I was saying, if you can predict, uh, if, if you can predict that the human says, no, that's incorrect, uh, condition on, on you, the chatbot, saying playground to that question, <clears throat> then you've kind of understood what the answer should be. So this is, this is the idea. So you can do this with forward prediction. So you can make a machine learning model that's trying to predict that next response. The thing is with these responses uh, from the teacher is they can be extremely rich. Uh, here's a, a, a very, very rich uh, example where instead of saying n no, uh, the, the the teacher says, no, the answer is kitchen. So now this is much more than you could ever get from a numerical reinforcement learning reward, which would you know, ordinarily be zero here. You actually get the answer, kitchen, sort of encoded in there in the text. So you only have to try and, uh, if you can extract this, you can, do, um, you can generalize a lot more. So this can still be done with the forward prediction. Basically, if the forward prediction of your model can predict that, then, then you've, um, you've learned much more. So that's the idea. Uh, so we've, you know, uh, we have two papers on this, basically the one here at NIPS and one on Archive, which has, um, goes beyond this simulated data and, and collects data from Mechanical Turk of real human feedback. Here's some examples of that. They look much, you know, much more rich and complex than those baby tasks I was just showing. And, um, and you, you can do this thing. We used a, a memory network model uh, where ordinarily a memory network model is just sort of predicting an action, right, an output. But we bolt these extra layers on that condition on the output, try to predict the next response. Um, and when we do this kind of thing, uh, we can get some nice results without actually, you know, any numerical rewards or any like direct supervised learning, so we don't know the labels, we're just trying to act. Uh, we can get these kind of curves, so the epoch on the x-axis and the accuracy on the y, where we can, the forward prediction, it's called FP, the blue curve, is doing better than something that uses numerical rewards in some cases, like when you have a more rich um, textual response than just yes or no. Um, so that, I think, is an interesting direction. Um, but now I'm going to look just at the case of uh, asking questions. So this is just one kind of uh, action that the chatbot can take. Um, so you might have the human say something like, how do you like home tanks? <laughs> So gave this kind of weird example, because uh, I was trying to uh, pick an example here where you don't really, the idea is that the chatbot doesn't really understand this example yet. So we've like flipped um, Tom Hanks's name here so that it's something that the chatbot wouldn't, wouldn't know. So the idea is that the chatbot could try and ask a question, right, and make an action that asks a question and try and learn about this new thing that it doesn't know about. So in general, you know, there's always going to be new words or new phrases coming in that your, your, your chatbot doesn't know about. So the idea is to try and understand that it doesn't know and then to try and ask a question to collect information and use the answer to that question to learn and then perform better. 
So we've tried to basically set up a bunch of um, experiments that evaluate whether our current models can capture this. Can, or first, are able to actually ask you know, the right question, and then secondly, whether given the answer, they can use it to get better generalization ability. So this, and then, you know, the hope is that then when you put this thing online, it's able to ask questions, it can do that in a smart way. So you might get, like in this example, if, you, if the chatbot asks, who is Hom Tanks? You might get the answer like, Hom Tanks is the leading actor in Forrest Gump. And presuming that the chatbot knows something about Forrest Gump, it might then be able to answer this question, uh, oh yeah, I like him a lot, or something like this. So here's another example. For exa if you do, to get rid of this weird spelling uh, flip, if you don't know who Tom Hardy is, I mean, he's a, also an actor, uh, slightly, slightly less well known. So how do you like Tom Hardy? Who is Tom Hardy? Tom Hardy is Max in Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, oh yeah, I like him a lot. I find this, this example maybe a bit more realistic because sometimes you know you know the movie that an actor's in and you sort of know the character because you've watched it but you don't know the name of the actor. But once you get that uh, link from the question, you can you know, then answer it. So this is sort of an example uh, of something that we do in real life. Um, so you know, what would a, a current chatbot system do with this thing? Probably not very much. So it would be something like, how do you like Hom Tanks? And this would be, re uh, the Hom Tanks would be replaced with an unk, like an unknown, because we don't have that in the word embedding like dictionary. So it's like, how do you like unk? And then, you know, it's gonna just sort of, it's not gonna ask a question, right? It's just gonna give some sort of output, even if you've trained on this thing, and then who knows what it's gonna say, basically. So this, this is sort of the current uh, situation we're in, so we need to be able to ask questions and collect information and 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 use it. So you know, or you know, you might have some systems that try and search the web for that, or that might not work either. Um, so the setting of our experiments is using this movie QA dataset that we uh, we built in previous previous work. So it consists of um, of questions, answers, and uh, possibly responses from the teacher, plus a big knowledge base of uh, movies, directors, actors. I think there's about 75,000 entities in it. And we kind of use this as a base to construct this simulated uh, uh, setup where we can consider different kinds of question answering um, abilities of a bot and, and see whether it whether it can perform well on them. Um, so we identified three kinds of question, and so that we can split that up and, and check whether we can get models to do these different kinds of things. One is called, we call text clarification. This is basically where, you know, the human has said something, and you kind of, the bot doesn't really understand the surface form itself. Like there's, you know, a missing, missing word, like, or, um, yeah, things like this. Um, then knowledge operation. Uh, this is where it's kind of understood the surface form, but it's unable to do the actual reasoning steps uh, involved. Uh, for example, you know, finding the relevant things in the knowledge base and then sort of returning them. So it's unable to do that part. Um, and finally, uh, what we call knowledge acquisition, the, the actual uh, answers it's looking for aren't actually in the knowledge base, so then it needs to ask questions to gain this missing knowledge. So there's other kinds of questioners, classes of question as well, but these three seem kind of, kind of natural. Um, so yeah, in particular for knowledge acquisition, you could also break that down into parts, like you could not know, not have uh, the entity in the question inside your knowledge base, so you don't know uh, what movies Hom Tanks was in, for example, 
So that would be, we call that missing question entities. But you might also not have the answer entity, like, so that would be a missing answer entity. You might have the relation missing, so you don't know anything about the starred in or directed relation, thinking of this as a knowledge base, or the whole triple is missing. And we kind of broke down also our evaluation in the paper into these different parts. So there's actually a, a, a quite a big breakdown of, of all these different things. Um, so how much time do I have left, anybody? Five minutes, so um, yeah, there's really uh, these things, there's really a lot of them, so I'll just show a few. Um, so like this one, the question clarification, we, we built it by making some misspellings of, of words, basically, so we could guarantee that they weren't in the word embedding sort of dictionary of our model. And then you could have questions like, what do you mean uh, that would get the answer from the teacher? I mean, and uh, the answer from the teacher would basically be a paraphrase of the question that the words, it would know the words. Or you could have a much more um, detailed question like, do you mean which film did Tom Hanks appear in? And then the teacher would tell you uh, yes or no. So we, and then you have to answer the question, basically. After, so first the, uh, the model asks a question, gets something back, and then it can try and answer the question. And those two things we call like task one and task two. Uh, and we, we have like 10 tasks or something like this. So. Uh, yeah, which these two, we just sort of separate them. Basically, the one on the left is much more general questions, and the one on the right is kind of a more, more specific uh, guess. So you could imagine a, basically a certain cost to asking these kind of questions. Like, you know, because you could always have a bot that asks, what, what should I say, or something, you know, and ask for the human to, to say, what should you say, which would kind of always, if the human could be bothered, always get you some good information, right? But the problem is humans don't want to do that, right? They're lazy and they probably, and they're not going to be engaged. So typically it needs to kind of not ask too many questions and they need to be, show that it has some sort of intelligence. If, if it's not going to do that, then it's not going to work. So yeah, so uh, I'm going to kind of skip some of these because there's really a lot. Um, maybe I'll just show you this one. Uh, so this, here's another task. It's, yeah, knowledge acquisition. So here we show um, the knowledge base the question: which which movie did Tom Hanks star in? Uh, the bot can say, "I don't know." What's the answer here? And then it gets the answer directly. Then it's, that's followed by a, a bunch of other conversational dialogue, and then the question's asked again, and we see if, if the bot can get that correctly, uh, get that right. So I'm going to skip some of these settings. Uh, so we looked at uh, both an offline supervised setting, where we basically just built the data sets uh, with a fixed policy, and then we looked at an online reinforcement learning setting. Um, so in the, in the offline setting, you basically, you know, you can download these data sets off, off our website and you can just sort of see that they look like this. You have the teacher's question, the dialogue history, the knowledge base, and then you have, you have to, tr the bot has to try and get the right output. And so that's at training time, you can train on that data, and then at test time it looks basically the same and you just have to, has to predict the output. So. And then we look at sort of different settings um, where I, either the bot is never asking questions, so it's called train QA for question answering, or the bot is always asking a question, so we call it train AQ for asking question. And so basically we can compare these two, right? So we want train AQ where it's asking questions to be better than train QA. So that's the whole point of, of this exercise. Like if we can see that asking the questions give better performance, then, then this is interesting. And we look at a mix where it does sort of half and half. Um, and then at test time, you could do the same thing, uh, either have testing only on question answering or testing with asking questions. So you can look at this kind of like um, 
in an exam setting, like in a human exam setting, you don't get to ask questions, right? But in a, some other settings, you do get to ask a question before you answer. So this is these two settings. So yeah, so then, so that's it. You have the train QA and train AQ and the train mix, and then you can compare it to the tr test QA and the test AQ. <laughs> so a little bit complicated. Um, so we can look at some of these settings, like the question clarification. We get these kind of results. Um, so basically train AQ plus test AQ, so it's asking questions at training time, asking que questions at test time, that's always performing best, and that's happening basically across all our tasks, um, which is good, that's what we were hoping to get. Uh, train mix is also working well, and uh, tr yeah, train, uh, train AQ, so you train asking questions, but then you test without that, that's, um, that's not working because it's basically the distribution uh, is changing from train to test, so it's confusing it. That's why, but that's why the train mix basically fixes that because it sees both cases. And uh, train, and I'm not asking questions at train time or test time uh, is, is basically worse than this one where you can test. So, so that's on the task one, and this is just another, another task I can show the results of uh, one of the knowledge acquisition tasks. Uh, basically, if you're not asking questions at test time, you just can't, can't get this right because you don't, get the, you don't acquire the knowledge from asking the question, right? So it's just not in your KB, and that's why all these numbers are terrible. But if you get to ask the question and test, uh, test time ask the question, you can do something. Um, and um, yeah, so then we did a reinforcement learning setting. Basically there we did what I was, I was sort of saying um, earlier that if you, so this question, which movie did Tom Hanks star in? If you ask a question, what do you mean? You get a cost for that. How long do I have left? Like zero. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm just gonna, you get a cost for that and basically zap, zap, zap. Uh, what you can see is that as the question cost increases, um, it are, the, the bots ask less questions uh, and the accuracy goes down as the question cost increases. So it's, it's, it's learning how to ask questions and it sort of tries to learn how to ask them at the right time and it improves when it can ask them, when the cost is, too, is, is okay, is not too expensive. And so yeah, so that's it. Hopefully then the goal is, can we get a, a chatbot to use these two things to understand a teacher's re feedback response and to ask questions to learn interactively online? Thank you. We have time for one or two more, one or two questions for Jason while the next speaker sets up. When you say online, when are we going to see this on Facebook, do you think? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would love to do that. Um, I'm going to do it as soon as possible. The problem is that uh, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg sort of problem that if it isn't uh, interesting enough at the beginning, then no one's going to want to use it. So you have to get to a certain level. So I'm thinking, uh, we probably need some sort of bootstrapping tasks uh, just to get it to a certain level so it knows how to ask questions a little bit. You know, it needs to know how to learn at least, even if it's not that good. And if it can show it can learn, uh, then people might be engaged to teach it. Uh, but that's already still a hard problem. But I think we need to get to that level. And if we can, then maybe there would be a sort of virtuous circle where we were kind of it was learning online and getting better and better, but uh, right now we're just not there yet. So we've only just sort of got some of these tools and uh, yeah. I have one question, which is uh, reinforcement learning has largely been applied to uh, agents in uh, like robotics and, and video game domains and other sorts of domains other than dialogue. How, how have ideas transferred from those domains to dialogue and how have they not transferred well? 
Well, uh, I think this morning you had uh, there was or, already a talk by Joel, right? Uh, um, and there's the next one after me is also about. I mean, I'm actually not an expert on reinforcement learning, um, and I. But I mean, I'm not so into the numerical reward thing. <laughs> Sorry, like, and that's what in in my talk I'm like, let's use the textual reward. Let's use so, the forward modeling, and yeah, maybe a little bit of numerical rewards. Um, but I think one nice thing about uh, dialogue is a lot of it, the rewards are quite immediate. Like you get back feedback from the person talking to you uh, straight away. I mean, a lot of the time, it, not necessarily this long distance stuff. So, so it, maybe it's easier in some way, but, you know, but we expect great things of it in terms of the semantics. So I don't know, there's different properties of it. Thank you, Jason.